Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Suter. I'm the founder of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. And today we're here to talk about data analytics, uh, challenges and solutions in the COVID-19 era. Uh, it's gonna be a great day. I, I appreciate everybody uh, taking time out of their day to join us here after lunch. And uh, we should have a great conversation if the prep calls were any indication. Uh, but I'd like to welcome all the attendees. Special thanks to Scott Moore, Roger Crombie, Ryan Del Delone, Ozzy Nelson, uh, and the rest of the MicroStrategy team. They've been a great partner, and they've been in this game for, I think it's like 20 years now or so. They've been around as long as I've been around. So uh, they've been a great partner, and we really appreciate them helping us here. So we're going to hear from our panelists today. We're going to have some Q&A. We're going to pop in a poll question or two and then answer to get to as many questions as we can. So start thinking about once these panels start rolling, uh, panelists start going. So if all the panels can uh, unmute and uh, turn on your video, we've got some great backdrops today, I've noticed. There we go. Uh, so I'll, we'll just introduce everybody real quick. Um, Tom Sasala, uh, Chief Data Officer, US Navy. How are you doing today, Tom? Great, Tom, thanks for asking. Yeah, and, and you've got some stuff going on in the background there. I, I'm quite, I, looks like some erector set or something back there. You've got a couple things going around. What do you, what, what is your backdrop there? This would be uh, my robot army. I have a CNC machine and two 3D printers for my various hobbies. That's fantastic. And uh, next up we have Bernardo Buenveja. Did I get that uh, close, Bernardo? Sorry about that. Yeah, that's pretty close. Uh, one viaje. <laughs> Great. Um, so are you at the office today? Uh, teleworking. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you for joining us today. And we also have with us Debbie Brott Giles, uh, Data Science and Innovation Group Manager at the National Renewable Energy Lab. How are you doing today, Debbie? Very good. Thanks for having me today. Yep. Looks like you're at the home office. Home office. Like today. myself. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. And we also have with us uh, Dr. Eileen Vidrine, Chief Data Officer, U.S. Air Force. And uh, it looks like you're, are you at the International Space Station or something? I know you're, you, you know, working with Space Force there. Um, I like the backdrop. No, no, this is our backdrop from our most recent um, Datathon that we partnered with the, our innovation cell AFWorks and the MIT AI Accelerator. And um, we Great. work on a C17 puck scheduler challenge. So this is our backdrop from our Datathon. I love it, I love it. Um, next up, Ron Thompson, Chief Data Officer and Associate Chief Information Officer at NASA. How you doing, Tom? Can you hear me? I can, I can hear you fantastic. Okay. Good, I love good. your, you got your NASA backdrop going. Yes, sir. Good to see everyone today. Uh, thanks for having me out today. Great. Um, and last but not least, we have uh, Ozzie Nelson, Senior Vice President and General Manager, Public Sector MicroStrategy. How are you doing today, Ozzy? I'm doing great. Thanks again for organizing this, Tom. We appreciate it and for all the panelists. No, no problem, no problem. And you're in Northern Virginia, I believe? Yep, we are in Tyson's. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, so let's get right into it. Maybe we'll lead off with you, Eileen. Um, let us know a little bit about what's going on going on at the Air Force and some of the challenges that you're facing. Well, um, for in the Air Force, we're really trying to just um, take the the foundation work that we've done over the last year and just try to go faster. One of those areas is really about um, enabling air and space professionals across our department to um, give them um, visible, accessible, and actionable data moving forward. One of them was just recently we did our first datathon uh, in, in a virtual environment where we had uh, several hundred airmen across the globe work together to um, solve a scheduling problem, which was pretty amazing because um, our winning team 
um, came from all different um, capability and functional areas. And in a very short period of time, they were able to come up with a 92% solution. Um, and we were able to take other work from that datathon and bring it back into um, our the accelerator that um, the Air Force stood up at the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology to try to um, even perfect it even more. But it's really about, for us, agile development process, get, get capability out there and just keep building um, and empowering that air and space, space professional to um, have the data and the tools necessary to drive insights at the operational, tactical, and strategic levels. No, that's fantastic. I'll ask a, a couple more questions, but that, that's, a, that's a great start. And uh, next up, uh, we'll go with uh, Tom Sasala. Got to find, that, find mute that mute button. <laughs> don't don't hey, feel hey, too hey. bad. One of these, I, I had it on, I had the mute button on for about three minutes. So uh, <laughs> that's all right. Three uh, seconds is no big deal. I've seen the t-shirt, you know, you're on mute. Uh, so <laughs> I'll just get, like, get myself one of those. Well, hey, thanks for having me, Tom. Appreciate it. Uh, it just occurred to me this morning, actually, when I was doing something unrelated, uh, tomorrow is my one year anniversary as being the CDO for the Department of the Navy. So um, I feel pretty proud about that. Uh, not too dissimilar to Eileen, we've actually spent the last year really just trying to get our foundations in order, uh, building up the data management program. You know, me personally standing up the office, getting people hired. All, some of the you know mechanical things that need to happen, but more importantly, you know we made a lot of successes over the past year. Uh, we actually uh, did some great work with Eileen and other folks on the DoD data strategy, which you know fingers crossed will actually be published soon or signed, I should say soon, um, and then subsequently published, right? Obviously, uh, and then uh, from there we've written our implementation plan for that da uh, data strategy, which we are currently uh, trying to wrap up on the dawn as well as a constant of appointment that we wrote to tell us, you know, kind of how we're going to structure our data management program inside the Dawn. And then we've done a lot of work implementing an enterprise data environment. Uh, again, you know, with Eileen and uh, OSD, great partners there to uh, kind of get our environment in order. Uh, so we're a little bit, uh, I would say, behind from maybe where I think we should be organizationally and institutionally, but uh, we're making great progress and great things to come in the upcoming year, which I'm sure we'll get to um, but I'm excited by where we are and uh, continue to move out and, uh, you know, conquer the, the great world of data management and, and despite of, uh, you know, worldwide pandemics and whatnot. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Uh, and next up, uh, Bernardo. Uh, yes, uh, for, the, for the past year, uh, we, we had just launched our analytics and evaluation division um, with the focus of uh, combining uh, data management with analytics and measures and reporting. Um, and with the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, it was a good test of our centralized uh, cells. And uh, so we're just uh, improving our processes, uh, getting our uh, cycle times as fast as possible, et cetera. Uh, that's where we're at right now. Yeah. No, thank you. And uh, next up, we'll go with Debbie. Great, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so for those that don't know, I'm with NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and I'm a group manager um, for a group called the um, Data Group, which is Data Analytics Tools and Applications. So really all we do is focus on um, data-driven web applications, big data analytics, we do machine learning, predictive modeling, artificial intelligence processes, and a lot of other great interesting things. Um, for the most part, we deal with open data um, and we try to ensure that our data is open as a national lab and available for people to use outside of the lab system so that uh, we can really hopefully um, encourage innovation um, in the areas of energy. Um, so I would say that in a world of COVID now, um, having open and accessible da data is even more important than ever. Um, we are doing tons of work, but um, two projects that come to mind um, for a topic like this is that I just like to bring up our um, uh, the Open Energy Data Initiative, which is a project that we've been working on for quite some time now. And um, really, it's all about getting NREL's large data sets out to the public so people can use it and leverage it. Um, and it's not just NREL's data, it's all of DOE's data. And for that matter, 
uh, other federal agencies data as well. So what we've done is we, we've built a data lake in the cloud using Amazon Web Services. And so it's out there so you people can put large data sets into this platform, do analysis, do computation, do data mashups in the cloud. Um, it's really important because typically a lot of our NREL data sets have been, especially our big data sets, have been on our high performance computer inside the laboratory. And so it's actually hard to get to those data sets sometimes. So um, we're talking things like our national solar radiation database and the wind toolkit data. These are really important data sets for innovation and for analysis and for research. And they're very, very big. They're, you know, hundreds of terabytes. And so now people can access these data in the cloud um, and be able to actually use them like they never could before. Um, and then the other platform I wanted to just quickly mention is the DOE's National um, Lab Partnering Service website. And this is really um, a website that's really geared to um, promote data and patents and other laboratory um, resources that are available at the national labs. Um, and then when COVID hit um, a couple months ago, we worked with our national lab partners to um, pull together our national lab data that would be useful in COVID responses. And so now if you go to the LPS website, it really helps enable kind of a rapid discovery of expertise and services and patents and researchers and subject matter experts that can actually help um, the um, you know, industry um, conquer COVID. So um, that's been really exciting and rewarding as well. So in general, we do a lot of open data. And I think that um, in a pandemic, open data is even more important than ever before. But thanks. No, I agree. I remember when, you know, we started doing open data and, and just in the beginning, how much of a challenge it was to get that infrastructure up. And it seems so obvious now, but I think it was like 2009 or so the open data and, it, and, and and things have been really moving from there to get access to different data. So that was a very big initiative back in the day. Um, last but not least, we have Ozzy and, and uh, Nelson. And, you know, Ozzy, it'd be great to get perspectives because you, you work across government um, as well as industry. And, and it'd be great to hear from you some of the trends that you see, especially since COVID. Yeah, thank you for that, Tom. That's one of the things that has been unique about the experience for us as we've been working with our, our customers on both the commercial and the government side as they've navigated this. Uh, you know, we did a study last year. We found that 97% of real-time enterprise decisions are, are what we call data deprived. And for about 60% of employees, they can't get the data they want and when they need it. And so what we found with something like COVID, it really, if, if you were in that category, it really came to light. Um, how uh, a crisis that if you couldn't get access to the data in the time that you needed and our customers um, on the commercial and government side that were further along in the data maturity curve um, responded really well to the crisis from you know our, from our little viewpoint and compared to the other customers and some of our customers that were further along you know it was a little bit more more of a, of a struggle for them um, and so you know immediately one of the areas where we noticed um, um, the most use for, for our data analytics was in human resources and HR. Um, you know, everyone had the issue of coverage with people working from home. Um, some jobs required people not to work at home, be there. Um, there, were, there were temperature checks, there were health concern issues, and how do you manage this and keep your operations going? It was, it was critical because some people just, organizations, especially in government, just can't send their workforce home. Um, and so how do you manage it and ensure that you have the right, uh, right, right people are there? And so we had a couple customers, um, you know, uh, in the government that were able to use analytics very in some in some AI and some machine learning really to, to manage the workforce very very effectively um, um, and that was one of the success stories we saw with analytics another area we saw success in you know and again the use cases are the same whether it's a government or commercial was was in you know retail um, you know, there, if you have a robust data analytics capability, you can respond to the changes in the markets very, very quickly. So some of our retail customers, you know, nobody knew what was going to sell, what wasn't going to sell, how COVID was going to impact what they were doing and how they are operating. And we had a couple of our retail customers um, that were able to adjust their inventories and, and their pricing models very, very quickly um, as the COVID uh, buying um, signature was, was unfolding. Great, great, great. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, my first question is, is uh, a lot of 
a lot of your components, they're, they're starting to play with these different tools. And many of you have created an environment where you can onboard different types of tools and get access to different data sets. Um, interested to see, uh, and Debbie talked a little, about a little bit at her organization, but it'd be great to hear from your organization what, what that looks like. And then, you know, utilization rates, um, you know, what, what's happened since COVID? And, and maybe we can start with you, Eileen, if that's okay. You're gonna, you're still on mute? I got I, I'm mute, okay. yes, thank you. Um, in, in the Department of the Air Force, we built a cloud-based um, instantiation. We call it VAULT. Uh, stands for Visible, Accessible, Understandable, LinkedIn, Trustworthy. Um, aligns to some of um, the primary tenants of the soon-to-be uh, released and uh, published uh, DOD data strategy that we're really excited about. Um, finally, um, really giving us that overarching guidance. But um, it's a cloud infrastructure, I call it a multi-tenancy cross-domain solution. So we started and it was scalable. So we started at impact level four, matured it to impact level five. Then now we're at impact level six with a cross-domain solution. It's in the AWS GovCloud. Um, we started with primarily um, open source tools because I can give them to every airman. So um, Python, R, uh, associated libraries, Kylo, NiFi, um, but it has matured out to add additional commercial products. Most of the commercial products that have come have actually been requested from our, our air and space professionals out in the field. So we have uh, visualization tools like um, Trifecta, uh, our our Tableau, and then we added Trifecta recently. Um, our ops research community uses a tool called Databricks, which has uh, really helped us over the last few months, but it's maturing every day. And uh, we get, and really we use a rapid ATO process so that we're constantly trying to mirror what we have in, at IL-5 up into IL-6 um, so that we can do as much um, possible. I like to say it's a, a fully ATO'd sandbox so that multi-tenancy allows you to separate your production from um, your developmental um, efforts. But it's really, I like to say that we started it and it has just grown. Um, I like to look at, you know, my pre post COVID type capabilities. And I, I um, tell folks that our, um, what I can say in this field is that we have actually more than doubled our constituencies and um, both in terms of tenants as well as um, as well as users and we just expect that to continue to grow um, but I think the critical piece is we did infrastructure as code so that we could rapidly onboard um, capability so I think that was a game changer for us to be able to rapidly bring people on board and then also only bring people in when we had to bring people in, which using up to IL-5 as much as possible and then doing that automated cross-domain solution, I think is was really another game changer. It actually helped us clearly make sure that we could deliberately and intentionally protect our workforce as well as really optimize performance. No, that's fantastic. And uh, I'm gonna go next to uh, Tom and add, if you can talk a little bit about what you've done at the Navy. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, you know, not to sound too kitschy, but you can just take what Eileen just said and insert Navy everywhere you said Air Force, right? Uh, you know, our platforms are actually very closely aligned. Uh, so the Navy has a platform, it's called Jupiter, doesn't stand for anything, but we have a nice logo, so that's good, right? Um, and so uh, we spent the last year really working with OSD to take what they've done as a single tenant environment and turn it into that multi-tenant data cloud environment that can interact with, uh, with Vault uh, as well as with the Army's Vantage uh, platform as well. And then because of the way that we did our implementation with OSD, OSD already had a lot of the naval data sets in it. Uh, we were able to carve those data sets off and provide better access control, better security, better uh, control around that. And then our partnership there is allowing OSD to continue to focus on some of the infrastructure capabilities that are uh, not user facing. So we have now switched our focus really in bringing in some of those best of breed tools. Uh, we have basically all the same tools that uh, Eileen kind of iterated through there as well. Uh, we do have Click, which is one of the visualization platforms we have. 
We just had a request not uh, last week, uh, you know, for Power BI and things like this. The different tools and capabilities are things that we're able to put in and plug in very easily because it is an open data platform, right? And so rather than picking maybe, you know, one piece of software we kind of went all in on, we decided to do that best of breed approach, which I think has provided, you know, value to us. Um, you know, we we ATO'd our instantiation of Advana, again, which we call Jupiter here, back in June. Uh, since then, we've uh, increased our usership by uh, roughly 60% uh, or so. Um, and so we're, we're over 5,000 users. We're actually approaching 6,000 users now. Um, there was a kind of a a large spike when we launched, obviously. Um, and then there was gonna be a massive spike actually because of COVID and the way in which we're using the platform to do COVID uh, reporting and COVID analytics. Um, but what we did is we kind of opened up some of those dashboards so you don't have to have an account. Uh, so you can still look at the data and visualize the data without creating all that additional drag of, uh, you know, and Eileen knows this, I'm sure other folks in the government, we have a special form that you have to sign and get signed. Uh, by multiple people to get an account. And so it's not time consuming necessarily. It takes a couple days, but it's it's something I didn't want to have to do for 6,000 additional users, which is what we're talking about, literally doubling the size of the platform. So uh, we kind of avoided that and that's good news. And so we were able to take that time and energy, reinvest it into the platform. We're bringing on some new, new data analytics tools, tools specifically geared for predictive analytics as opposed to descriptive analytics, right? Um, and more importantly though, uh, labor, bringing on skilled labor sets, not only in terms of the former contractors, but training for our government uh, employees, uh, military and civilians, right? Uh, and so really one of the things that we're gonna focus on this coming fiscal year and into the future is really the, you know, the acumen of our workforce, uh, increasing their skill sets and, and getting them to understand not only how to use the data, but the value of the data and then driving that value and that quality all the way down, uh, you know, from the point of creation all the way to the point of consumption, right? Uh, and so the folks that are creating the data understand the consumers of the data, right? So they understand the value of getting the data right going in. Um, I'll give you a, a great example from uh, last week, two weeks ago, uh, we're, we're building this investment dashboard to help us drive Palm 23. And uh, we integrated seven different data sets. Uh, all of them had a single primary key that we're supposed to link all the data together. Um, one of the data sets was 15 million rows. The other one's a couple hundred thousand rows. Long story short, when we integrated all the data and we looked at the final data set uh, that we were able to piece all the data together, there was only um, uh, about uh, 60,000 rows left that had all the data elements, required data elements filled out and all the required proper uh, uh, keys. And so, you know, my question was, well, you know, we got to, we have tens of millions of rows of data that are not complete, right? Um, you know, how do, how do we, how do we dig in on this, right? And so that is actually provided as a great launching pattern and thank goodness, um, I, I suppose it's an upside for us, but we, we actually showed the CIO um, who's the recipient of this particular dashboard say, hey, here you go here's the data that we found. And oh, by the way, if you had these three fields in this one system, you would have an order of magnitude more data to look at and analyzed. Uh, we're still getting some value out of the data, but it'll be a lot more valuable if it was more complete, right? Um, and then the completeness, and Eileen knows this, we talk about this all the time, is leads us into the conversation of trustworthiness, right? And so that's a very uh, qualitative assessment of whether or not you trust data. Um, but we're going down this road of certifying dashboards, right? We have a uh, a proliferation of dashboards, which I'm sure folks know what that's like when you when you stand up a tool that's easy to use and you suddenly have access to data you never access to. The first thing you do is all these people are generating dashboards. Well, what value are these dashboards? Is the is the analytics that are driving the dashboards useful, or are they combining the data in the right way? Um, so we're going to start this this process of certifying dashboards and saying if you want to know about X, like COVID, for example, you go to this set of dashboards. There can be other COVID dashboards. We're not impeding anyone's ability to do that. Um, but if you want authoritative sort of ground truth and then go to a specific location. Um, and I know that's something that, that, that Eileen's working on as well as the broader DOD community. So that's exciting for us because um, I, uh, you know, I, we as IT professionals, um, at least me anyway, I, you rarely get to see people use your stuff and put a smile on their face. <laughs> Usually it's the other way around. So <laughs> that's been exciting for me. <laughs> That's great. Um, how about we shift over to NASA? And I know, Ron, you've got the challenge of, you know, basically all the labs and, and all the, con, you know, the centers, and then you have like all these external constituents that you, that NASA deals with regularly. Um, love to hear what you have to say about the infrastructure you've been working on. 
Yeah, I mean, just like, you know, our colleagues in, 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 in other parts of, of the government, we're about in the same place, uh, the same maturity level. You know, we're really doing that internal focus, getting our, 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 our arms wrapped around, you know, what do we have, setting up our governance structure. Um, you know, and as you know, uh, NASA has a lot of data, you know, just like Debbie was talking about, uh, petabytes of data out for Earth science, exploration of planets. Uh, that data is be uh, is been available for for a number of years now, but what we're finding is uh, taking another view of it. Um, some of it isn't easy, easily as accessible as you should be. So, you know, so we have to look at tagging, but uh, but the way that data is out and how it's used right now, it's really uh, out there in specific purposes, specific buckets. So we're taking a look at that, working with our. Um, scientific and, uh, and research side of the house, uh, taking a look at how they do that. So that's sort of the public facing data is really get a, get a handle on how we're doing that. And then internally, we're focusing on, on our analytics platform as well. That's really the conduit into all of our data stores. We're, we're not, uh, it looks like we're leaning on not really setting up a data lake per se, but standing up uh, interoperability into the data sets and providing a standard way to access that and a standard way to visualize that. So, you know, when COVID hit, um, we did not have a way to look at our posture across our geographic centers to see uh, where we had uh, cases increase and what that really meant for our people. So we quickly put a team together. It was a very agile team across um, our disciplines. Uh, HR came to bear. So we were able to take data sets for leave usage. Uh, you know, Ozzy mentioned, uh, uh, you know, uh, agencies doing that. We were very early in uh, our, that awareness, doing that for our medical community. Uh, they were spending all day Friday going out and harvesting data from the local hospitals. And we were able to do that in just in a matter of seconds. So, so we saved a lot of, of time for, uh, for that community to really look at the holistic view across NASA, not a center by center view or not a geographic uh, uh, specific view. Uh, and then we are building on that. We're calling it the executive uh, decision lens. We're building on that platform uh, to put other data sets in, in our inventory. So, uh, you know, fortunately for us, we, we have uh, pretty, uh, just about every tool known to, uh, to the community. <laughs> so we're, we're picking and choosing what makes sense for us and building it out. Uh, Tom, I think you and I do need to talk about how you 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 open that up for other usage because we are having to approve that usage base access. So maybe we can go offline with that topic. But uh, but yeah. really, it, it is really liberating the data to make better decisions, and that's really the essence of the act, and that's really the maturity of what we're seeing across NASA right now. Fantastic. Um, and next up, let's go with uh, Bernardo over at yes. DHA. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we've been focusing our activities. We just uh, switched over to the cloud over the summertime. And so uh, transitioning our systems, uh, troubleshooting all the different systems connected to it. Uh, but uh, the entire time with a heavy op tempo of uh, enforcing, well, not enforcing, but reinforcing our lab data, markets, our market data, uh, bed data, um, our return to operations and all the other uh, activities associated with uh, COVID and then linking all of that with all of our modeling. So we, we've been pretty busy uh, and then maturing a lot of our data visualizations uh, so that we can get to the daily uh, monitoring of things. And then uh, also, uh, I guess our our platforms are similar to everybody else's Tableau, Click, uh, Advana. <laughs> so, uh, but it's been a very, uh, very busy time, 24/7. Right. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. We'll get into that a little bit. And Debbie, I don't, you covered it a little bit. Is there anything else you want wanted to add to this subject? Um. Yeah, I covered most of it. I think, um, I guess I will say, though, that our usage has gone up um, since the pandemic started. We're seeing that more people, I guess, are home and ready to do some analytics. So they're diving into the data um, and we are seeing that increase. Um, uh, we're also working internally at our national lab to implement a, a national or a 
laboratory strategy for data. Um, there's obviously the federal data strategy. And so we're looking at that and we're leveraging that um, as a national laboratory to make sure that we're handling data um, in a more, um, I guess, collaborative way across the entire lab. Because I think that um, traditionally people are doing a lot of data analytics in their own silos. And so we're really starting to look about trying to bring, uh, look across the lab, uh, create best practices, try to get people to be doing things similarly. It doesn't all need to be the exact same, but um, similar in a similar fashion so that um, the data has similar quality um, and, and so similar standards, metadata, things like that around it so that it, everything can be very accessible. Great, great. Uh, next question. I'm going to start off with you, Ozzy. Uh, what, what use cases have come out of COVID, some interesting use cases that you've had to deal with. I know that your phone has been ringing pretty pretty heavy since the COVID had started. Um, some just some use cases, whether they're they're federal or commercial, would be great. Just uh, if you can add a little color there. Yeah, it's it's interesting. <clears throat> Thanks for that, Tom. One thing I did want to point out is the theme. I think I'm picking up from some of the panelists that, that we we run into is that we had the self self service explosion about a decade ago, <clears throat> which was great. We equipped everyone with the ability to do dashboards. But what industry has found out that you know an analyst with a dashboard isn't always a positive thing, right? Because sometimes you have competing and dueling dashboards, and so the the industry is really evolving to more of a theme called govern self service. So <clears throat> this is how we're helping and this is why it's important COVID is now they want to get more information to their employees but how do I do this in a way where that data is is, cent is governed from a central location but distributed widely and that the information is accurate um, and so that's one of the trends from a, from a more technical aspect that we're seeing is, is agencies um, do that and of course we're seeing that from, from what the panels are saying and then the other one too is that no one has a homogenous you know data environment number one data analytic tool to this day is Excel, right? So you have to be, uh, you have to be interoperable. You have to be open. The technologies are changing so rapidly that if you don't have an open platform that can operate in any environment, whether it's, uh, you know, AWS or Azure or on-prem or hybrid with the same type capabilities, it just doesn't work with, with, for your customers. They need to be able to have that flexibility to, to respond to these type things. But as far as the specific use cases, again, number one was human resources for sure. Um, you know, I touched on that early on. The second one was, was really inventory management. And then the other one we're seeing a real growth. It's something that we've done traditionally, but it's starting to pick up. Is, is financial management, um, particularly in the form of, of improper payments, which is a huge issue for the United States government. If you look at something like the CARES Act, um, the amount of money that can be distributed, if you can reduce improper payments just on that act alone by 0.05%, you will save billions of dollars of taxpayers' monies. So it doesn't take a lot to make to save a lot of money. And we're seeing a lot of our customers are starting with, the, with these, these amounts of grants and loans that they have to give out under COVID is how do I do this effectively and, and do my auditing and, and avoid things like improper payments. Thank you for that. And uh, anybody else that wants to add that some of these use cases that have, have come out, uh, you know, I, I tr you know, I, I, can, I can think of, you know, how do I track my, where my employees are, those, you know, those kinds of things, medical areas, um, you know, maybe Bernardo, I know, I, I know you've, been doing a lot with the with the healthcare. Is there anybody who wants to talk about some use cases that have kind of bubbled up with COVID? Uh, Tom, I'll jump in here. I think this is a really good yeah. example of how the federal CDO council is working. Um, you know, I mentioned sort of um, the, the the COVID executive decision lens we have, and that that's really the analytics side. But we also stood up a, a contact tracing app as well. Uh, that, that COVID information was, was coordinated across government. So it was across CDC, HHS, and we dealt with a lot of the early uh, barriers that existed. We dealt with that through the CDO Council. Um, and it was a, a, a working group, a sub working group of the council itself. And that is where we were quickly able to identify the authoritative data sources, uh, come up with standards in the way we're measuring things across uh, across the agencies versus taking a specific look at it. And I think there is a really good example where you can take, um, you know, a specific purpose and actually the way we did that 
uh, start to uh, exchange information across government agencies right now, because a lot of the ways we do this right now are bilateral, uh, and it takes a lot of uh, a lot of effort in a bilateral agreement. But we were able to stand um, stand up a way that we could all grab um, and exchange that information uh, consistently and from one from one authoritative source. So that's a really good example. I, I know I know others were were part of that, but we were able to take what the uh, the state and the locals have done, and it, we we put it on a Salesforce platform, and it was a very light lift with our medical community to do a contract tracing app that was specifically for our organization with very little customization, I would add. Wow. Um, anybody else want to chip in a little bit? Okay. How about that? Don't all jump in at once. Uh, no, that's okay. Uh, well, let's, uh, I think we're getting a little bit into this and I think it'd be a good time, Alyssa, to do a poll. So this is where you can interact with this. Uh, we do these very, very quickly, and they sometimes turn out interesting. Sometimes they don't, they're not so interesting, but hopefully we can do well. Okay, what's the biggest barrier agency is facing during pandemic? Identity management, security, lack of IT issues, lack of reliability performance, other. And then what is the biggest challenge your agency faced when switching to remote work? Okay. And then we'll kind of relate this back to data. Okay. All right. Let's see what results we have. We got a okay. Pretty across the board. Collaboration. You know, so let's just bring this back to uh to your work has this affected you how has it been you know sharing data working with people how has that affected some of the challenges there is uh for the the folks on the phone hey tom oh. this is tom uh so i just want to note uh, the department of defense i don't want to say used the pandemic as an accelerator, but we are able to get a lot of new technologies rolled into our infrastructure that I do not believe would have ever landed on the department if it wouldn't have been for COVID. Um, and so I don't want to say it's an upside, but what it is is opened our eyes to really what it means to be a lot more nimble and a lot more agile and how we implement our IT infrastructure and the risks that we're willing to accept to a certain extent. Now, you know, the original thought was this was only going to last a few months, so you we can accept the risk and now we're nine yeah. ten months in and we're looking at another six months or so um and so the risk posture is starting to change and the conversation is starting to change how much risk we're really accepting and, and you know what's really happening in the, in the infrastructure so you know our, our primary barrier going into this was just providing access to it resources for remote users right uh, we have a lot of good data on exactly how awesome we were going into this um so I have an 11 year old knocking on the door. <laughs> um, but, uh, so we did focus a, a lot on the kind of productivity side and the collaboration side early on um, via VPNs and traditional technologies. But I'll tell you the use of CVR and Teams really opened the aperture for the DoD. Now, oh, pause there. <laughs> Great, yep. Anybody else? Um, I'll just jump in also. I guess I'd agree with that um, wholeheartedly. Um, we, for the most part, I, I, clearly we're using Zoom now, but we also use Teams a lot at NREL. And I feel like it's almost even more collaborative now that we can kind of jump in and discuss things. We used to have some stand-ups in the morning. We work in an agile environment sometimes. And so now we can still do those meetings um, through Teams. Um, we also can have conversations a lot more quickly, possibly, because we're not looking through email, we're looking through kind of um, team chats. So I think that it's um, opened our eyes to new ways of working together um, and, you know, having our data more accessible um, improves all of that uh, collaboration as well. So, I, so far it's been, it's been very good, uh, but I, I also do miss, um, you know, personal interaction with people so hopefully we get back to the office soon <laughs> so so Bernardo? tom i think oh sorry we'll let Bernardo go ron that's yeah you know, go ahead ron um so tom i think nasa has a really good story here um 
we, uh, our previous CIO, Renee Wynn, who's since retired about the early part of the pandemic, had the, the foresight to put in, um, you know, cloud-based tools, Office 365 environment. So a lot of, a lot of, uh, so this is less about the tool versus more about our posture and our positioning. So the timing of that was absolutely uh, brilliant for us. We were able to not skip a beat. I think NASA was one of the very early agencies to, uh, to go full telework. Uh, and we still are in a pretty much that posture as everyone else is right now. Uh, but we were able to uh, continue our productivity, uh, shifted, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, uh, getting used to the new, new platform and how it worked. But our, our cadence, uh, as you can see, uh, we're launching uh, on a frequent basis right now. Uh, that's one of the uh, very few uh, national pride uh, things we can celebrate, I believe, is our launches. Uh, so we, we, haven't, we haven't really slipped our schedule there. So we're launching uh, pretty much on schedule. And stay tuned, by the way, October 31st will be the next uh, SpaceX commercial crew in partnership with NASA. Uh, uh, launch for that uh, for that program. So we were able just to to naturally gravitate to these online tools and uh, and conduct our business with not only with our internal uh, workforce but our our partners, uh, both commercially and other nation partners, uh, to uh, to do what we need to do. So it has really worked well with us. I think you know as Tom mentioned, uh, we opened our eyes, and I think this is going to be a much different way of working going in the future and data plays a humongous part of, of um, you know, what that looks like in the future. So it's not only the tool sets, but getting the right data. Um, and, and I know our, our DOD uh, folks, uh, uh, you know, dealing with uh, some classified data is not, not exact, you know, those are still huge barriers in working through that. We have some of that problems, but not, not, not as much as I'm sure the DOD or other, other classified agencies do. So. Um, this is Eileen, and I agree with my colleagues on the panel here that it's really, um, ex the change has accelerated because we have new tools that really got forced into the platform. But I think that the other piece in the, the poll said that collaboration tends to be a challenge. So one of the ways that we took was we tried to uh, cr um, really uh, recreate or redraft and in a deliberate and intentional way to create precise opportunities to push that collaborative component. So one of the things that we created was we did a, a webinar series called Innovation Connect. And originally our plan was to do that once a quarter, but we're now doing it once a month because, and really it's an opportunity, not, and it's not an Air Force story, we reach across the department. So we reached across to Tom's team and literally last month we highlighted uh, Navy's Project Unicorn. And so really it's about taking some amazing lessons learned and sharing them across our environment so that we can really take that and have people build from it rather than recreate their own piece. And so um, la, um, this month we had, or well, I guess it's October and September, we had uh, the MIT AI Accelerator come in and talk about their use cases, but we also had DARPA come in and talk about their alpha dog fight story. And so it's really taking data stories and really kind of highlighting some of the ways that we can really take those amazing lessons learned. And so I would just say that there's ways to really push that collaboration by just being deliberate and intentional in, in, in really planning those opportunities to really push that cross collaboration, which I think is critical, not just in the, yep. in the military departments, but across the federal space. That's great. Uh, anybody else want to add anything to that? Uh, okay. Well, Another thing that we've seen across the federal government, and especially in this field, and I, I know the White House has this data and analytics uh, cohort going through right now. I, I would just like to hear a little bit about workforce transformation and how, how that is enabled inside of each of your organizations. And uh, is there anything we can, you know, having better tools can help, and, and, and if you want to add into that, Ozzy, and what, you, what you've seen. But uh, Eileen, you, if I can start off with you again, because I know you've got a lot going on at the Air Force, maybe you can kind of kick us off on that topic. Well, 
Um, well, I appreciate the opportunity to share because we really look at it. It's, it's not just bringing in great talent, but upskilling and building that data acumen across at all levels, tact, operational, tactical, and strategic. So uh, we have, you know, a year ago plus we started the first data science interns coming into the Air Force. And that is now um, a reoccurring process. I'm really excited about this year, this fall, for the first time ever, um, cadets at the United States Air Force Canada Academy can actually major in data science and they will end up in all functional areas, air, space, intel, um, logistics, et cetera. And I think that's going to create a whole new velocity. So it's, it's really trying to bring a talent in, but also um, upskilling and really investing in the people that we have and different people learn different ways so with digital university we partner with industry to bring in some very high-end um, online content to um, upskill folks and to really um, pick and choose what what they want to build their skill set but we also have deliberate ways of um, what i would call traditional uh, we have short courses longer courses. Uh, we also have uh, a brand new partnership with um, AFID, uh, Air Force Institute of Technology, to do an online graduate certificate in uh, data analytics. And then the last piece, which I think is the fun, the fun part, is doing data thons and really um, giving people opportunities to what I have um, go through active learning to upskill during um, on specific topics. And um, the topics from our, for our datathons come from the field. They come from the commanders and senior leaders that say, I have this opportunity that I really want to crowdsource solutions. And it's, I, I like to use, I used to use the tagline, hashtag built by airmen, but um, and now it's built by airmen and space professionals. Great. Um Anybody want to go next? Uh, Bernardo? Yeah, our, our organization, uh, we've just uh, re reorganized. So we're about a year and a half into this. Uh, we, we do offer uh, training for uh, all of our uh, people that use our health data. Uh, it's called the wisdom training. We're incorporating it with our new electronic health record. And uh, uh, those courses are, are continuing to happen. We're going all virtual. Uh, so we have a team of teachers that teach uh, virtual uh, for our, our data analytics uh, access to our information. Fantastic. And so, uh, yeah, so all that is continuing. And, you know, we're in a period of change with uh, the new electronic health record, merging it with our CHCS systems. And, uh, uh, you know, we're also in the middle of a NHS transition <laughs> with all the services. So uh, this is a, a period of lots of change. Yeah, it's like the Manhattan Project over there, uh, the EHR. Uh, I think that every time I talk to somebody at DHA, that's like, it's right at the top. Right, so and, exactly. and we're doing a lot of joint work with uh, VA, uh, learning alongside with them. We've formed a lot of collaborative groups with everybody. Uh, but also with the COVID, it's been a really good collaborating with all the services, with the modeling, with all the technical uh, discussions, and a very, very refreshing how easy it was to collaborate with everyone. Yep. Yeah, and hey, Tom, I'd, I'd offer too, because Ron mentioned it earlier, there's a lot of discussion and work that's going on at the Federal CDO Council uh, around the whole workforce initiative. There's a I think we called a sub working group or a subcommittee, I think it was exactly, on really getting after the, some of the issues around acumen and skills. And, uh, you know, people have been more or less clamoring to have some sort of position description or standardized way of describing what it means to be a data professional. Um, you, know, you know, people use the word data scientist, uh, Eileen and I have, uh, you know, kind of been beating, uh, beating this uh, drum for a while now. It's a lot more than just data scientists, right? We need a lot more skill sets than just that. Um, what I'm finding is our number one limiting factor right now is not people to exploit the data, but people can understand the data and get it into the system in a form that people can exploit it in, right? Um, you know, a lot of these tools, front-end tools, have become very user 
friendly, right? Um, and so the ability to get into data, data and start pivoting and, and doing things is actually quite easy. Now, obviously writing, you know, machine learning algorithms and AI algorithms is a little bit more of a specialized skill, um, but that uh, on a maturity scale, that AI and ML stuff happens way after you do data, data engineering, way after you do data acquisition, data cleanliness, right? Um, and you got to do some basic descriptive analysis Right um, before you can say, well, how do I want to get into prescriptive or other higher forms of of, of machine learning and, and artificial intelligence? So, uh, we're I you know we're not there yet. I think <laughs> we're largely as a community and certainly on the um, on the Navy side, MPS uh, just like Eileen, they've started a program as well, the Naval Postgraduate School, uh, and so I've been working with them a lot on that. And in fact, we're using uh, this uh, kind of it just escapes me what it's called right now, but we have a, a, a internal sort of cohort of folks who uh, we pull together as grooming senior leaders, the GS 12, 13s and, and 14s, 15s, um, who want to become senior leaders. They engage in senior leader development program. Um, and so this year, the development program is centered around data and data analytics, right? Um, and so we gave them some freedom to go off and say, well, hey, what do you really want to do? We, I came in with me, me and my team, and he said, well, here's Here's Jupiter, for example. Here's the data that we have in Jupiter. Um, if you don't have, if you want to do a program that is not supported by the data that we have, that's great for us. It'll help us acquire the data maybe that we need. Um, and so we actually have a meeting, I believe, or an outbrief of, of their initial findings in another couple of days here. So that's good because you get people who are not data professionals, right, but are subject matter experts, right, now engaging in a data platform, which uh, they become your your champions, right? Because they are now able to answer questions and do things they would not have been able to do otherwise, right? Um, and it's uh, what it means is rather than, and, and Eileen knows this, right? we spend a lot of time educating people, right? Um, I need to do less of that, right? Because or I, I can do less of that because now they are carrying the message as well. And they become the, uh, they become that emissary or that, you know, that, that straight man in the audience or straight person in the audience that says, hey, wait a minute, what about this, right? We can use this platform or whatever. Uh, and we just actually had this happen, um, believe it or not, uh, with the CNO. <laughs> Someone in the staff said, why can't we just use that thing over there for this, right? Um, the thing being Jupiter in our case, right? Uh, so, so that was good. And he was like, well, what's Jupiter, which is a different story. <laughs> you know. So um, that's another educational thing, but uh, the VCNO knows what Jupiter is and that's what matters, I suppose. But uh, that's just another example of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Ron's point about the community coming together and helping each other. There are agencies that are wicked far ahead of us. Um, and there are some ones that are, you know, kind of behind us looking, uh, you, you know, looking up saying, geez, I don't even know how to tackle this problem. And so leveraging those lessons learned, taking the experience of folks that have had successes and failures. Uh, we have a great, uh, I forget exactly what it's called, Ron, Eileen, may remember the thorn and rose yeah, moment at, rose. The, yeah, at the CDO council where people go through, here's what I did great. And here's what I did that was not so great. Um, so not saying to you, telling you to avoid that, but maybe do it differently than we did. Um, I actually found I find those really informative. I really do. Um, you know, just always hearing about the happy moments is, is great, but then, uh, you know, kind of end up in this psychosis that everyone's succeeding and you're not right. But that's not the case. So that, that's always useful for me. Yep. Oh. Yep. yep. Debbie, I didn't want to leave you out of this conversation. Yeah, no problem. Um, some of the things we're doing is um, trying to increase our DevOps environment so that people are not just just a software developer or just a cloud engineer they're doing kind of both so that's one thing that we're doing to try to um, improve our workforce development and then the other thing we do is i bring a lot of um, new fresh talent into my group as an intern i know eileen mentioned this but i think bringing in interns and kind of training them alongside the rest of the developers and the rest of the data engineers is really important and then we look always to try to spin them out into the other parts of the lab so if somebody comes in as a geophysics major with a data science passion we kind of try to train them up on the data science side and then hopefully spin them off into the geophysics world and now we have a really great um, data engineer, data scientist out there working in, in a certain topic area. So we do those kinds of things yep. too. Fantastic. Okay. And, and Ozzy, I, just as just on this topic, I, I know you've been doing this for a while. I, I remember, you know, 10 years ago, it was like you had to be a Renaissance IT person to do this kind of work because you didn't have APIs. You, you had to set up your own environment and you were, it was, you know, a couple server under your desk, you had to procure it, you had to do all. Where are you? 
where are we now? Where is we're making this more frictionless? What has some of the trends that you've seen at MicroStrategies? Uh, um, where's the market? Where's the market matured, and where is it going in the future? And the big thing that we're seeing with our customers is kind of what you touched on, Tom, is it's migrating out of, you know, the CIO office, we jokingly call it sometimes the basement, where there's just another tool in the inventory that they have to pay for and manage, and then the business owners may or may not use it. While we're seeing, you know, there's again this proliferation of governed self-service, the business owners, the mission owners are now demanding the analytics. They need everyone, everyone to use it and want to make these decisions. So we're seeing a lot more interest and a lot more demand generation coming from, from business owners for analytics that can be used to, to make those decisions. I think we see that again with the creation of, you know, the CDOs and, and, and that moving in that direction. So that's a very positive trend because they're the ones that value the benefit the most from it. They're just not the maintainers of the product. And then the other thing that we're seeing a lot of too, and you know, in our biggest sector by far is financial services. You know, they've got some extraordinarily sensitive data as well and security is of the utmost importance with them as, as well. But there's the point, there can be the continued push to mobile. Um, and so, you know, it was, it's, it was great having analytics on, on your desktop and that's very useful, but now they want to have analytics in their palm of their hand to be able to, to make a decision at that moment in time when they're on the go. And I know there are restrictions when it comes to the U.S. government about mobile, but, you know, from industry wide, especially in the commercial sector, that's where we're seeing it headed. Hey, Tom, I just have a, just a quick little ad. I know we're running short of time, but um, I, well, I would just foot stomp, you know, a lot of a lot of what was discussed here by the panel about the skill sets and needed. Uh, but but what we're seeing in NASA is part of our transformation and, and this this world fits into it is that is the case for change, the case to do something differently. So this is a cultural shift to say, hey, this is needed. Uh, first. So we're coming to the point to say what forcing functions are happening to us and, and in NASA it's co the commercialization of, of space travel and, and other uh, nation states getting into the space. But why do we need to behave or do something differently? So we're really anchoring it, not only to the skill sets training and what's in the Evidence Act and all those things we have to do, but making sure we communicate, we have to behave differently. We have to behave as an enterprise where we can, where it makes sense, but, but we must do things in a different fashion. So I just wanna add that to the, to the discussion real quick. Yeah, I'd like to jump yeah. into it. There's a couple of questions in the chat window, um, um, but uh, you, you know, you mentioned about behaving differently. Uh, so, so this has been a, an eye-opening moment for us in terms of uh, not, not, not getting sucked into the kind of status quo, but the, the amount of duplication we saw going on. So the pandemic has actually allowed us to say, hey, you know, we got to scale these things, but everyone has their own individual solution. We can't scale each one of them at the same time because the amount of resources yeah. would be, you know, uh, massive, right? So we really, this has opened our eyes really to, from an IT perspective, to shared enterprise services, kind of moving to centralized models. Um, and when I say centralized, I want to be careful about that because I don't mean pulling all the resources into one thing, right? But the, the notion of having, uh, you know, some top-down approach to it. So we say that take this one thing, best of breed or whatever, scale it, um, everyone else folds into it, take those resources, percentage of those resources folded into the enterprise solution. And then there's a percentage of resources that are left over. That is additional capital, right? Typically a CapEx of some sort or another, maybe OpEx for us, um, that we can then use for some other investment from a modernization innovation perspective. And you'll hear Aaron Weiss, who's our CIO, talk about this a lot about, you know, we are engaged in world-class spend from an IT perspective for the Department of the Navy, but we're not achieving world-class results, right? So let's focus in on how we more effectively spend our money to achieve outcomes that are significantly more impactful and meaningful for the mission, right? Um, and, you know, you know, 365 and CVR and, and even the data. So the COVID thing is actually um, put a premium on data now, right? Um, people were talking about before in the DOD, don't get me wrong, it's always been a thing with the intelligence community and in the, in the DOD about data being important. But now, I mean, the DevSecDef logs into a live data portal every morning and looks at COVID statistics and looks at the impact of the installations into the workforce, into the warfighters, um, into readiness, right? Um, with data that's reported the night before, right? Um, you don't get that in the previous world we were in, 
uh, you, that, you know, it would be a monthly brief via PowerPoint with data that was gathered 45 days ago, right? Um, and you're talking a 90 day window, right? Um, and, and so the senior leaders, the most senior leaders of the department, Deb Sec, Def Chairman, Vice Chairman, tell this story themselves. You can't get any more of a powerful story than that about us helping to protect our kind of nation uh, through live data analytics. I mean, that's a unique environment and it has opened their eyes to the value of the data. Not only, you know, uh, uh, you know time to market or speed to mission for us, right? Um, but also just the, the, the value of being running optimally as a business, right? Which is something that maybe a lot of agencies, us included, are not as uh, effective as we could be. <laughs> Yeah, I think people want on their phone. They want real live data. And uh, Ozzy, a node to your boss, uh, Michael Saylor, I remember he wrote that book about seven or eight years ago about mobility. And that was really what it was about. It was about, I want real time data on my phone at all times. And uh, I think that I think that's where we're, we're finally getting there, which is fantastic. Uh, just real quick, well, I want to close the panel, but we're just in a, just a few seconds where we think uh, some big things are going to be for next year and the next couple of years where you want to be um, and if each of the panelists can do it maybe starting with you Eileen where do you where do you see the Air Force in just the next couple of years in the relatively new term near term I like to say that um, this year is hashtag velocity we have to you know we've built a foundation and now we just need to scale and and and, be, and continue to be agile so when that next great thing is available we can pull it in today and, and you know so we're not deploying data technologies who you know currency is here to stay and and we just have to um really pick up the ops tempo we have the moment now we just need to um keep going well said how about you ron yeah, I, I, you know, it's sort of like what we just heard. Um, I'm not sure how much is this doable in the next two years, but I would like to see every, um, uh, not only employee of NASA, but everyone that uses NASA data have insight and um, uh, access to to all the data that we have because what we're seeing you know NASA is not just about space it's about aeronautics right it, you know it, it's about a whole nother side of discipline it's about space exploration it's about human flight so have have our commercial partners have access where it makes sense protect intellectual property where it makes sense but have have accessibility to our earth earth science data uh, for our for our, our planetary data have, have that available to to uh, the citizens out there to the fully extent possible. So that's where I would say success looks like. I'm hoping, Tom, in the next two years, that'll be doable. Fantastic, that's very aspirational. I think it's a great idea though. Uh, Debbie? Sure, I agree with going faster and being more accessible and scaling up our data sets, right? So we um, have this data like developed, but we need to get a lot more data onto it to make it more usable and useful. Um, and then the other thing is we've built it so far on AWS and I would actually love to see us build the same capability on Azure and Google and maybe maybe others, but that way you that way we can really expand the accessibility because some some people like Google better than AWS, for example. Also, Google offers different things, especially for geospatial data. Um, so Anyway, so that's what I would like to see is kind of more ATOs on more cloud platforms so we can get more data out there and make it even more useful. Fantastic. And Tom? Yeah, so the next, uh, you know, let's say 12, 24, 48 months are really for us, not only focus on what Eileen said about scaling and, and making the data more accessible and having more data in a platform, but it's what I call positioning and protecting the data, right? Um, putting the data where it needs to be given to the users that need it at the time that they need it in a form that they can consume and that they trust, right? Um, that's really one of, is one of gonna be kind of like the seminal moment is when decision makers, whether it's a commander in the field or a senior leader in the Pentagon, right? Has the data they need when they need it. And they, they just inherently trust the data is accurate and timely. Um, and, and the data, rather than make them unsettled, which is what it's doing now, brings them comfort, 
right? And so that's kind of where we need to be. Um, data just becomes part of a data-driven culture uh, that is available on demand um, and is synthesized and integrated and, and, and fused in a way that is useful for the person that's consuming it. Um, you know, we got a lot of work to get there. Um, you know, the, Eileen mentioned the culture of just awareness of data and whatnot, but uh, um, the tools the tools are there. Uh, the uh, you know you know Debbie mentioned you know uh, the, the ability for us to get access to different tools in a more timely manner. That's something that the COVID's starting to change a little bit. Um, just the notion of of accepting more risk. Um, I personally I don't know that I am going to be successful uh, as a as a professional, but I would like to see a lot more interagency reciprocity. Um, so Debbie, you don't need to certify. Tableau, if we already certified it, right, just accept and say face value that, you know, we've done a good job and vice versa, more importantly, because typically we're the ones that don't accept <laughs> ATO. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but, but uh, being a little bit more open about that. And, and uh, I, I, I think it was Debbie talked about the dev off pipeline, but um, start using real agile system and software development techniques um, to provide the IT tools that are necessary, but also apply those sec techniques, which is something that I've started doing with my team in the last couple of weeks, uh, we actually are full scrum on our data team, right? Data engineering activities. Uh, I have a stand up every morning. We do this, the grooming and the backlog and all the, the magical stuff that we do with scrum um, as a way to get increase that op tempo, right? Um, decrease the time to market um, and maintain focus on things that are uh, important. And so unfortunately, our backlog is like 350 items long now, right now. So. Oh, and we're not sure what our velocity is, but we're getting there and we're building that momentum. So uh, that's a good news story and, and it can, we can only get better from here in my opinion, so. Good, and uh, Ozzy, where are we going next two years? Uh, it's just gonna be, everybody's touched on it. I mean, this is a, this is a transformational moment. COVID has caused us to do this. And, and I think the use of data is just gonna continue to, to, to accelerate. And, and we're gonna see government in particular rapidly pick up some lost ground on the data analytics curve. And I think that that's been pretty evident in all the comments by our panelists today. Great, great. Well, thank you, Ozzy and Mike Strategy for helping to put this together for us. It's been very, very helpful, good, good, good stuff. And I'd like to, uh, Thank all the panelists, uh, Eileen, uh, Ron, Ozzy, Debbie, Bernardo, who had to leave a little bit earlier, and, uh, and Tom. Our next event is actually, Ron, are you, don't leave, go anywhere. This is actually an event we are partnering with NASA on, uh, Digital Transformation Virtual Event. And I will actually let, I didn't, this just kind of worked out, Ron. <laughs> I didn't really plan for this. I, uh, you want to talk a little bit about what you're trying to do at NASA with this digital transformation virtual event? Sure. So uh, today is the first uh, day of the new fiscal year. Um, I am assuming a new role. Uh, so that role and that title or the title and that role will change. Uh, I will, I'm retaining uh, the chief data officer um, uh, that conveys, but I will be co-leading um, the uh, digital transformation office. So for NASA. And we would like to uh, talk to the community about the good work that we've been doing on digital transformation. Uh, Tom, I don't want to take the wind out of the sails, but I'll say enough to whet the appetite. I, I think uh, we've been talking to OMB uh, recently and, and other federal agencies. I think NASA is going to be a leader in this space um, on actually transforming uh, an organization using digital as a lever. So you'll hear from uh, many, many uh, leaders of the organization. We have Steve Jerzyk, who is our associate administrator. He is the highest career level of NASA. And I have worked uh, closely with Steve in my tenure here at NASA um, and find him absolutely brilliant. So he's gonna kick us off. Joe Marlowe and I are, are the, are the uh, uh, we're gonna be in the business innovation office. So that's the name of our new uh, office. And, and that's with the what's called the A-suite. So that's with the administrator's office. And Jill has 30 years experience in NASA and I have 30 years experience outside of NASA in other spaces using digital as an implementation. So Jill and I make a very good team. And then you'll hear from each of our thrust, what we're calling our thrust area. So the, each of our areas on AI machine learning, culture and workforce, we touched about the, oh, that today. There's a, there's a thrust on data. 
itself. Uh, there's a there's a thrust on uh, process automation that Mary Davies leaving. So many of you know Mary from GSA. She's joined us at NASA. We're glad to see see Mary with us. So you'll hear from leaders in this space in NASA really taking the conversation forward, tightly coupling with mission and making transformational again using digital as a lever, making transformational. Uh, 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 choices, decisions, path, path forward. So we're going to do down and in deep dives on each one of these topics. And we look forward to having everyone there uh, for, for this conversation. Okay, thank you, Ron. And thank you uh, to the audience for sticking with us. I know we went a little bit over time. Uh, tough to cut off a good conversation. And thanks again to the panelists and everybody have a good afternoon. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for doing this. Thank you, Tom.